In the 1950s, Walt Disney married two ideas, imagination and engineering, creating a new word, Imagineers. He applied it to a group of men he charged with creating his dreams for the future. He built the Imagineers a home and called it WED, an acronym for Walter Elias Disney. And the rest, as they say, is history. That team of Imagineers has one thing in common, and that's a unique opportunity to see people year after year enjoying the dreams they turned into reality. Randy Bright's roots as an Imagineer go back to his college days when he had a summer job at Disneyland. Today, he oversees all project development at the outdoor theme parks. Bill Justice, an animator for 20 years, was one of the original Imagineers. Designer Tim Delaney has been immersed for the last six years in Epcot Center's newest attraction, the Living Seas Pavilion. Ex Atencio was another Disney animator who made the move to WED to write scripts and musical lyrics for Disneyland attractions. Dave Fighton's imagineering talents involve a different kind of animation. He uses a computer to animate three-dimensional characters. What these Imagineers like best about their jobs is the opportunity to entertain audiences and to make sure their efforts always amaze us. As the moon climbs high over the dead oak tree, you'll see these Imagineers at work. Creepy creeps with eerie eyes. And hear of their unusual challenges. Grim grin and ghosts come out to socialize. In the Disney Family Album. You might say Walt Disney was the first Imagineer. Even as a filmmaker, imagination was his trademark. And his ideas about engineering and design opened the doorway to Disneyland. You, as the audience, come through a doorway, you sit down at a theater, and somebody closes off the doors before the film starts, and the experience starts. They close off the outside world. We have to do the same thing here in our own environmental design. We have a series of portals or gateways or windows onto the different worlds that people have to go through. And then we shut off the outside world. A perfect example of that, these people are leaving the outside world behind. So now as we come into this area, all the people are experiencing the aha, we've arrived kind of emotional response to that first act. This is really what we call act one of the Disneyland experience. It's like scene one in a film. And as we go down Main Street, you'll see the whole essence of Main Street begin to unfold like Act 2, or Scene 2, then Scene 3, Scene 4, and so on. Now we're standing here at the hub in the entrance to Tomorrowland, and you'll find that here's another gateway. Now what we have to do is not shut out the outside world, but shut out our own inside world. As people pass through this gateway, they're going to leave the rest of Disneyland behind, and they're going to a new world that's called Tomorrowland. We're going into a world on the move, and everything is moving. If we were at the other end of Tomorrowland, you would find submarines playing off of monorails, playing off of, again, the America Sing spinning building, playing off the Atopia cars, all that working. And meanwhile, what's going on overhead? Skyway buckets are looking down on this whole system that's working as a unit. It's very exciting. If Tomorrowland's world on the move is too frantic for you, try stepping through Frontierland's portal to the past. Uh, the feeling here, again, is to leave the outside world behind and come into a world of the Old West. And it's a narrow street again that you'll notice in there. And what beckons you at the end of that narrow street is the Mark Twain, or during the uh, more crowded times also the Columbia sailing ship at the other end. You have a vista, you have that long shot that uh, beckons you to come in and says, come on in and explore things and look around. It's not inside a show building hidden away, but it's out in the open. And you've got the the trees, the grass, the clouds in the sky, or the rain, or whatever. Uh, even on rainy days, it's fun to be here because it's a different kind of experience. Another kind of beckoning comes from the Disney costume characters who have been entertaining guests at the park since opening day in 1955. Imagineer Bill Justice was the creative force behind their evolution. One time I remember we were having a meeting and uh, 
And a lot of things were being discussed, and it got onto the costume characters. And somebody said, oh, let's get along with that. And Walt said, wait a minute. He said, uh, other people can copy our, uh, our rides. They can have thrill rides. They can have uh, bands. They can have uh, everything else. But the one thing that we have that's unique to our park are the costume characters. I don't care who it is, but it comes out. Mickey or Goofy, Pluto, anybody comes out. First thing they do is run and grab their camera and have their kids pose with those characters. And it, it's been quite a, a pleasure to see the reaction, you know, to those costume characters. When it's time for the characters to appear in a parade, their unique performances are partly Bill Justice's design. They find out what they can do, what their limitations are in dancing or anything like that. A lot of the funny things are like, Oh, like Baloo, for instance, it has a very low crotch. When you see him back view, he, he his whole rear end wobbles because <laughs> it's the only way he can navigate, you know. And a lot of the choreographers say, oh, well, we can't have the, that low because he can't kick his feet up. Well, that's his limitation. That's what makes him different than one of the Rockettes or something, you know. The most unusual costume character debuted in 1961. With a little Disney pixie dust, circus acrobat Tiny Klein became Tinker Bell, gliding across Fantasyland on a guy wire. Bill Justice later figured out a way to make a miniature Tinker Bell fly around the park, but it never saw the light of day. We did get it so it would fly around on a little remote control, radio remote control helicopter. And we could have had lights on her, we could have had some pixie dust and things like that, but it would have been sensational. But we found out that when it was all constructed, the lightest we could make it was about 12 pounds. And they wouldn't, uh, they were afraid it might crash and hurt somebody. One of Walt's favorite hobbies was crafting miniatures, such as this granny's cabin he made for so dear to my heart. With the birth of Wed, Walt's hobby became an essential part of the creative process. A key thing that we do at WED, as a matter of fact, is before we build something full scale, we build it in miniature almost down to the last detail. So dimensional model making was a critical part of this team that Walt built. Another critical part is WED's sister company, Maypole, whose name comes from the movie Mary Poppins. Right next door to WED, Mapo is a development and manufacturing branch of Walt Disney Productions. The dreams conceived at WED are hatched at Mapo. We on the creative side called for uh, ride systems, conveyance systems for the public, and theaters and moving screens and audio animatronic figures that walked and all kinds of things that, uh, that really drove our technical people crazy for a while but uh, our technical folks like challenges as much as we do in the creative area, and they were certainly up to the task. One of the most difficult tasks Walt Disney gave his Imagineers was the creation of audio animatronics. Just as we had to learn to make our animated cartoons talk, we had to find a way to make these characters talk too. Now to accomplish this, we created a new type of animation, so new that we had to invent a new name for it. Ooh, uh, 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 audio animatronics? Right, audio animatronics. Ooh. Audio for sound. See, and electronically animated by sound. That's, That's what it. he's trying to say. Thank Ooh. you, that was all I was trying to say. Excuse me, Walt. The first audio animatronics ranged in size from tiki birds to dinosaurs. Now, I suppose you're wondering what we're doing with dinosaurs here at the studio. Well, these baby brontosauruses are just a few of the hundreds of three-dimensional animated figures developed for the World's Fair. For the 1964 New York World's Fair, Disney unveiled four new attractions, all starring as audio-animatronic figures. The most complex performance, Abraham Lincoln. To start with, we were fortunate in being able to secure this life mask of the 16th president. Our sculptor, Blaine Gibson, has been able to create this very accurate likeness of this great man. During our exhaustive research into Lincoln's life, we studied his mannerisms, his gestures, and even his voice characteristics. What constitutes the bulwark of our liberty and independence? It is not our frowning battlements, our bristling sea coasts, 
These are not our reliance against tyranny. About all we could do with these hands originally was just to turn them a little bit and at one or two points we'd put them behind his back. And uh, we had to be careful as he passed by his coat that we didn't rub the thumbs on the coat or anything because within a week there'd be a hole in the in the coat and no thumb, no skin on the thumb. So crazy things like that. The hardest thing with Lincoln was to get him to stand up and sit down. If somebody stands up, normally it takes about that long, same amount of time to sit back down, you see. But if if I did that with Lincoln, he'd hit the top and he would vibrate, you know. And if I sat him down that quick, he'd break the chair. So, problems. So, we did it very slowly, about like so, and about the same thing going down. But what happens is it looks like I've got back trouble, you know, <laughs> when you move that slow, see. Audio animatronic figures soon began popping up all over Disneyland, but Walt continued to improve them, enlisting his animators, who knew more about movement than anyone. Animators like Exitential. After 27 years on the on the main lot over there, I trotted over to over here to Wed, and uh, <laughs> it was kind of kind of a shock to me. I'd I'd go by drive by the studio at night, and tears would come to my eye, my eyes. <laughs> I felt, I felt, yeah, I missed the place. I'd run back every day for lunch to see the guys. But after a couple of weeks at, uh, here, I got, got my feet wet and got an assignment. And my first, first job was Pirates of the Caribbean. I had never done scripts before. I had done a lot of storyboarding and things like story work at the studio. And the uh, auction scene was the first one I did. And I sent, sent it over to Walt. He said, yeah, that's, that's great. Fine, just keep going. You know, I, what I did was got out the old uh, uh, Treasure Island film and, and read some uh, old sea stories to try to get the, the feeling of the jargon, the avast there mateys and stuff like that. The thing you have to had to do is, to, is to get across the fact that here are some, some pretty raunchy old pirates chasing these ladies around and uh, well, we could, you know, come out and <laughs> blatantly say that they were that <laughs> they were doing bad things to these ladies, that they were but uh, they were having fun, and they were just a bunch of fun-loving uh, pirates. Next was the script for The Haunted Mansion, and Exitensio wanted visitors to be as frightened as possible. I always wanted to believe in ghosts, you know, when I was doing the research for this. I said, I'd love to believe in ghosts, but... And I think I have found that, that most people do believe in ghosts, or like to believe in ghosts. And so we had two schools of thought at that point, whether we should make it scary or funny. And some of us kind of wanted it a little bit more scary, and, but uh, the, the funnies kind of won out, so. Like the stretching room, but the room starts stretching, and you, and you set the mood, you get, you, people are kind of, they come in and they're kind of, kind of scared, but then you know, the room starts stretching, and then you see, you see the, uh, <laughs> the gags in the, in the stretching uh, portraits. And then bingo, all of a sudden, the lights go out, and you see the, the uh, ghost hosts hanging from the rafters way up there, that scares them, you know, and, so you just kind of just, you'd, you'd scare them and then you'd, you'd bring them back real quick. Exitensio's most challenging task was for Tokyo Disneyland. Picture an American Imagineer trying to translate his words into a language totally foreign to him. Well, for the, the Pirates of the Caribbean, for instance, we found out that what the ghost instead of saying, dead men tell no tales, he says, there is no mouth on a dead person. <laughs> so that doesn't make sense. That's what we're trying to do. Well, there's no... Japanese uh, equivalent of Dead Men Tell No Tales. So then they had to come up with something else that says, well, if you're not careful, you will not pass this way again. The process of imagineering stresses originality and development of projects, but creative strokes of genius don't just happen. Well, it's no magic light bulb that goes on. To get anywhere with a new breakthrough, you have to encourage uh, unconventional thinking. Most conventional thinking will bring you a predictability in the product that the public will bore of and get tired of very quickly. So we like to, with all of our Imagineers, uh, give them the freedom to really think from a blank piece of paper. And that's to 
think without any pre preconceived set of tools or notions or ideas in that earliest concept stage. And that's how you get your best spontaneous idea to begin with. What we're seeking to do now, for those who have been in the Haunted Mansion 30 or 40 or 50 times, I could think we could call that a predictable experience. A live ghost in this case, uh, what we seek to do in one hallway where we have some suits of armor, your car turns around and something reaches out and touches you. And as your car turns, one of the knights is alive and a large hatchet, an executioner's hatchet, comes down toward the car. That's unpredictability. That's something that you've never seen before and you thought you knew it all. If you come through there the next time, that figure may not be there or that figure may be in a different place. We may populate the haunted mansion with three or four live ghosts, if you will, that will do that. And that starts to put a dynamic into that that uh, is going to give you a new script every time you go in there. And that's fun. With the aid of a computer, wet Imagineers are able to reprogram shows at the Disney theme parks. New technology meant that the Country Bear Jamboree could stage a special Christmas show, and Abraham Lincoln got an operation that was state-of-the-art medicine. This figure is a, a, a little bit newer than what we have all through the park. And what we did here is worked with the University of Utah and um, their, their labs there. And what, what happens there is they, they make um, several of the artificial arms and limbs for different people and they try and come up with new improvements on artificial limbs. And so what we did is we sent uh, our robot figure out to them and said, what can you do to improve it? And they came up with a new system called the compliance system, which is a little red box that goes on the end of uh, each function or actuator. And uh, it controls that actuator more precisely and accurately than ever before. Disney's dreams have occasionally been Dave Fighton's nightmares. Yeah, all kinds. You know, you have, you have bears chasing your sleep, and uh, Lincoln, you, you may have problems where um, you can't get him to move how you want in your dreams. You know? Or sometimes he won't stop moving. You're, you're saying, that isn't what I want, and you no, I'm going to move how I want. And, uh, or sometimes he won't get out of his chair. I've had that dream several times. He's so strong that he can break almost anything or pick up something and uh, throw it. And there's been times where I was working on a figure where... Uh, I moved the arm the wrong way, and uh, instead of going on top of the table, went underneath the table, picked it up, and threw it all the way across the room over my head, and uh, just demolished the whole table. Uh, we're already talking of ideas of uh, making one walk completely on its own, where there's no uh, cord or nothing to it, and uh, to be hopefully just like a real human being. You just walk around, sit down, just like you and I. Problem is you won't know which it is. Is it a robot or a human? Thankfully, not all programming projects are as complicated. Oh, chickens, they're my favorite. Chickens are great, because all you have to do is sit here, close your eyes, and go like that. And they come out perfect. Imagineers make their living keeping their head in the clouds and their feet on the ground. But for three years, many of the Imagineers have been out at sea, designing the newest Epcot Center attraction, the Living Seas Pavilion. Upon entering the pavilion, guests will see a film described here by project coordinator Tim Delaney. We begin the film with a shot from outer space because this is really where you get the first perspective of this bright blue marble floating out in outer space. And you can see in outer space that this Earth is just teeming with life. You can see the clouds moving in. It's the only planet that we've ever seen that has oceans on it. Uh, the average depth of the ocean is 12,000 feet. Uh, it drives this whole weather system. Um, it um, you know, produces 90% of all the oxygen on this planet. This is the largest feature on the planet, yet it's the least that we know about. So as we head in towards, closer and closer towards the planet, we speculate, wouldn't it be great to have some sort of a subsea habitat or an environment that we go to that we could study this incredible ocean? And meanwhile, on the screen, we're building this computer image of this sea base, and we fly through it and end up in a position where we're about to enter into the sea base. The doors of the theater open up, and then we enter into this space here. Now what this is, is this is our, what we call our hydrolator load area. Now hydrolator is like an elevator. It's going to take you from Epcot Center down into the ocean. And as the guests come to this, this area here, they're waiting to cross this bridge to enter into a hydrolator. Now as they're waiting, they'll see hydrolators ascending from Seabase Alpha. And in, that indication comes from um, 
bubbles in these pools here just before the hydrolator comes into the station, a level indicator showing it's coming back up to the surface, and just before it arrives, we'll see these lights which represent the cab coming into the station uh, come up here. And as it does, then the doors open up and we enter into the hydrolator itself. About 18 to 20, 20 of our guests will come into this space here. And then the doors will close behind them and the lights will go out and, and we hear all the sounds of the uh, sea base below us and we're descending down into sea base alpha. When they come out of this hydrolator here, we're now going to board a vehicle which will take you to the visitor center of sea base alpha. Now at that point, the guests will be going down this tunnel and they'll get their first glimpse into the coral reef environment, the most beautiful of all coral reefs that we can possibly design. And for our guests, the experience they go into will be as if they've gone into the ocean. What it is re in reality is we've created the largest or the single largest saltwater environment ever built. It's five and a half million gallons, it's 24 feet deep, it's 200 feet in diameter, and uh, it's going to be quite an experience for our guests when they ride through it. Once the guests arrive at Sea Base Alpha, in the center of this mini ocean, they'll begin exploring the mysteries of the sea with a little help from some soggy tour guides. From behind the scenes, a crew member and a diver come out and speak to the guests, talk about whatever experiments are going on in the coral reef environment, uh, what's going on in the sea base, and as they're talking, this chamber drains with water. Then the diver will then go into this chamber, you know, flood this chamber, and still be in communication with our guests, and he'll eventually slowly swim out into the coral reef environment. By that I mean we have approximately 200 varieties of animals in here, uh, from the smallest damselfish to, to uh, gray reef sharks. They will be real. It is going to be quite different from anything we've ever done here at Walt Disney Productions. Uh, it's the first time we've ever have had live critters in one of our presentations. We have a variety of technological uh, events going on in the coral reef. We have actually two submarines which will be uh, swimming around the ocean environment. We have two what we call mini rovers. They're robotic submersibles which have lights on them and cameras. And it gives us the ability to fly these uh, mini rovers around and view various parts of the ocean uh, or the coral reef environment. One of these underwater robots will even be the host of one of the shows. Jason, an audio animatronic character, will treat guests to a humorous look at man's exploration of the ocean's depths. Visitors will also be able to step inside the latest undersea technology. This is what we call a gym suit. This is a uh, atmospheric diving suit that allows a diver to go to a depth of 2,000 feet and still work under the normal pressure that he would find at the surface. We've acquired two of these gym suits for our coral reef environment. One of them is actually in the reef and the other one is in the sea base. So what we're going to do is we'd like our guests to experience what it's like to be in one of these suits. This is an early, a very preliminary mock-up of this uh, gym suit manipulator game. And what will happen is the guests will be able to stand inside here, take one of the manipulators here, and be able to perform certain tasks that represent the type of tasks that a diver in a, in a real gym suit would perform. Perhaps the main attraction at the Living Seas Pavilion will be a dolphin tank, where the stars do more than jump through hoops. And the primary objective of this module is to showcase to our guests the ongoing research between man and dolphin through communications. And our challenge with this particular module is we really would like to get the guests to participate in the training aspect of, this, of the uh, dolphin here. For example, if we could bring one of the kids out of the audience and teach them some hand commands and then they can show the dolphin, the dolphin will respond and go pick up the ball or pick up the, the uh, baton or whatever they've, they've, the task is that they've been given. So it's another interactive type display or uh, activity that the guests can participate in. One of the most exciting entertainment breakthroughs being imagineered at WED is their simulator project. And what it's really doing is taking the principle of the flight simulation motion bases that are used to train fighter pilots and to train uh, airline pilots and taking that technology and applying it to a miniature theater in which 30 to 40 guests would experience just like they would in real time a very visceral experience and that is dealing with our sense of balance in our inner ear it's giving us all the physical cues that tie exactly to it I was on that race car in Monza. When he shifted gears, the whole unit lurched, just like it went through a mechanical gear shift. The 
unit induced all the road vibrations of our race car at 180 miles an hour, just shaking as you were moving along. Uh, going into the turns, it decelerated and we decelerated. It turned and we had lateral left and right g-forces being applied to our bodies. And can you imagine if we had a simulation experience like that, where we could simulate an Olympic bobsled run? Of course, you were there. You suspend disbelief instantly with this thing. Or if you were in a, an Olympic slalom course moving downhill, you literally are doing what that skier is doing. All the visceral thrills and excitement are there without you really going anywhere. But it is all programmed right into it. And what we can do with this, we can, we can sail plane, we can water ski, we can uh, go through swamps, we can have uh, simulated uh, Star Wars type fights in space, we can have all kinds of fantasy adventures. This box that moves and accelerates and does things with you inside of it can take you anywhere your imagination wants to go. In the world of entertainment, there's no job quite like it. Imagination and engineering, high technology and art never had a happier marriage than at Webb. In the world of television, you work on your product and you can see almost immediate results. And then you send it out on a vaporous airwave and it's gone in a nanosecond it's gone the filmmaker can put his film together and put it in a theater and if he's really extraordinary the film might be there for six or eight weeks the thing that is our reward as imagineers at WED is that our product is there for years and years and years whether you're catapulting down a canyon on a runaway train or taking a spin at tea time with Br'er Bear you're experiencing the triumphs of imagineering